So I was going to read Dragon Ball for the first time this year because it is the 40th anniversary. However, the recent passing away of the mangaka Akira Toriyama did make me want to read it sooner. It is a series that I knew about my entire life but just never really got into. I did read the first volume back in December where I did my 24 manga in 24 hours video challenge and so I've only read the first volume. I've never actually continued reading the series before but even after reading the first volume I knew I wanted to continue. So this video will be me reading all 16 volumes of the original Dragon Ball. I do know there are some spin-offs there was like Dragon Ball Z and I do want to read them at some point but I just thought for the 40th anniversary of Dragon Ball, I would read the original Dragon Ball, the, the series that started it all. And I did also want to honour Akira Toriyama. So that's kind of what I'm hoping for with my Dragon Ball vlog. I'm going to put these down now because they're actually kind of hard to hold. I did get the Dragon Ball complete box set and I love it. It's so cute. And I do hope that I can get to more of his work soon. This vlog will be filled with spoilers, so do be wary of that going forward. I will be covering each arc of Dragon Ball as I read through it in a read and vlog format. So after some internet research, this is what the arcs look like. So we have the Emperor Pilaf arc, the Tournament arc, the Red Ribbon Army arc, the General Blue arc, the Commander Red arc, Fortune Teller Barber arc, Tian Shin Han arc, King Piccolo arc, and Piccolo Jr. arc. And that spans 16 volumes and 190 four chapters. Hopefully all of that was correct. If not, bugger. So we follow Goku and he comes across a girl called Bulma and she is on a quest to collect the seven Dragon Balls. If all seven of the Dragon Balls are collected, then a magnificent dragon will appear and grant them one wish. These Dragon Balls are scattered throughout Earth and so we go on this like epic adventure to find them. I'm so excited to dive in so I'm not going to wait any longer. If you do end up enjoying this video, please do leave it a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Now let's get into Akira Toriyama's masterpiece. You know what? I got stuck in my head. You know that Miley Cyrus song? I came in like a dragon ball. That one. Won't get out of my head, but it's a cracking song. I finished the first arc of Dragon Ball, which is predominantly the first two volumes. There is one extra chapter in volume two that is the start of the next arc, but I'm just going to talk about the first 23 chapters. Yes, I do like to hold volumes up as I'm speaking because it's just like a support system. I do really like Dragon Ball because I did read the first volume last year and I thought it was very good. I really enjoyed the story. I like the idea of like trying to assemble these seven Dragon Balls in order to conjure a dragon and for that dragon to give you any wish in the world. I love that. I was actually so surprised that we actually kind of achieved that goal. Although, like, albeit in a totally different random way that kind of they didn't really achieve it, but I just didn't expect all seven Dragon Balls to be assembled so quickly and for the dragon to actually appear. And obviously it doesn't go to plan, which is great because I kind of like the idea of it being the entire 16 volumes of hopefully this quest, this goal in order to get these Dragon Balls. I love adventure stories so much. I love when there is a goal at the end of it. And so I was like, oh my God, are we really gonna have the dragon be conjured by the end of the first arc? Like we still have eight more arcs to read. What is that gonna be? It's called Dragon Ball, like what? But no, it, it, it's great, it, it's fun. And I do like the fact that we start over at the end of this arc, so all good things. And there are so many good things to say about this and I'm gonna talk about all of that. I want to briefly mention the fact that there are some things in this that haven't aged well, but it's something I don't wanna dwell on because I do understand it was a different time when this was written. But I don't want to not, not mention it because I don't want anyone to think that I think it's okay to do all of that kind of stuff in the first arc. And you know, some people have told me that it gets better and you know, a lot of the stuff, especially to do with like women and like I guess some nudity that was involved in this too isn't really that much of a problem moving forward. And it's not taking away my enjoyment of the rest of the story, but just know that I'm not okay, obviously with how things happen with Bulma, with Oolong, and the pervert turtle guy, which I can't remember his name, you know, the master, but my dislike for the things that happen and some of the gags that haven't aged well, I acknowledge it, and I'll talk about some of it as I move forward. I love Goku. I think he's hilarious. I think he is the most unserious main character I've met in a long time, and I see a lot of, like, Luffy in 
Goku, or at least like the other way around because obviously this came before One Piece. I can say the inspirations that Oda might have taken from Dragon Ball and Goku specifically in order to like create Luffy and One Piece. I say a lot of the similarities, I say the inspiration and I love it so much. I love how innocent and unaware Goku is. I mean obviously he does cross the line, like we don't love the whole Pat Pat stuff, but I can acknowledge that he is just so blissfully unaware. He isn't really like civilized. I do say a lot of like the Tarzan and Jane kind of dynamic a little bit between Bulma and Goku. I don't really know a whole lot of the inspirations that went into this or like the creation behind it. I would love to read more. I just don't want to get any spoilers so I'm trying to avoid any videos talking about Dragon Ball. But once I'm finished and all caught up I would love to go behind the scenes and see all of the inspirations and everything behind it and what went into the creation of this story. I think that'll be really fascinating. But the Goku and Bulma relationship like dynamic is just so sweet and not so much at the same time. I love when they first meet and Goku hasn't seen a car, he's only heard of them and he thinks it's a monster so he like blasts it and then Bomber's inside and he's like, oh, an even scarier monster has come out or something like that. It was so funny. But Bulma, she really does give as good as she gets. She's very smart actually. I do think she's a very smart person. She is the absolute opposite to Goku so that's why I kind of love their dynamic. Even though there are characters who try to sexualize her and do all of these like really pervy and gross things to her. She stands really firm, like she is able to sort of like fight back and bite back. So I think in a way that shows that Toriyama like didn't agree with the stuff that she has to go through just because she's a girl. In my opinion anyway, I do think the amount of times that she calls them like disgusting and perverts and whenever somebody tries to do something to her, like she'll see she'll beat them up and stuff like that. So hopefully it like hammers that point home that all of that isn't okay. And I definitely saw a little bit too much of Goku as well. I could have really done without saying all of that. I hope like in the future we see less of of all of that, you know? And hopefully we see less of Bulma having to do things that puts her in a really compromising position also. Especially when it comes to the Turtle Hermit, the, the master guy who I think we will see more of now. And I'm very conflicted on that. Like I do want Goku to train and get stronger and more powerful, but I really don't like that perfect. Like he's such a, a creep, like he's an old man. He continuously wants this 16 year old girl to show him her boobs, her panties and all of that. Like it's so gross. And even Oolong is like no better really. But what I liked was when Bulma was gonna make Oolong shapeshift into her and kind of make him be the one who gets groped by the old pervert. Obviously that kind of doesn't really go to plan, especially since Oolong kind of like goes with it and goes a little bit too far with it. But in a way it was a, a sort of consequence to both of their really perverted behavior. So I like that it's not just accepted, it is challenged. But the first arc of this, it felt a little bit random, a little bit unserious. And I wasn't expecting it to be as like humorous and silly as it was. I mean, even when I read the first volume of this, I still didn't think that the majority of this arc would be, I guess, more for the laughs than anything else. But it still really did well with the story, I think. But again, I was like so surprised by how quickly we got all seven of the Dragon Balls. Although, they, did they really get all seven? Like, they got six of them and then Emperor Pilaf, he had one of them, he stole all of them, summoned the dragon, and then Oolong is the one who got the wish for the panties. So despite the quickness of that surprising me, it still followed a adventurous structure and that goal of getting the Dragon Balls definitely drove it forward. I wonder like did Toriyama know that Dragon Ball was going to continue? I know it's kind of probably hard for manga kids to know if their series is going to last a long time. So I don't know if maybe like originally the story was supposed to like end at the end of the arc or something and they were going to get all the Dragon Balls and it'd be the end all over and done with. And then he kind of was told that maybe Shonen Jump was going to continue Dragon Ball. So then he had to like extend the story and make it so that they didn't get the wish that they wanted with the Dragon Balls and then have all the Dragon Balls scattered at the end of the arc. I don't know like the story behind that but it felt like you could probably end the story at the end of the first arc. So it would be cool to know if Toriyama had like a plan for the series, just because of how random some of the stuff was. So like Goku and Bulma, they do go on their adventure, you know, she enlists him with helping her find the rest of the Dragon Balls. And she has like the tracker to track them down. And she has these capsules that she can throw and it makes like a house or a car and stuff, which is so awesome. Like those capsules, ah, oh, could you imagine if we had those in real life? I wouldn't have to pay rent again. But I did love the whole capsule side of things. I thought that was really cool. So yeah, they go on their adventure. They come across a village where everyone's scared 
head of this shapeshifter demon who turns out to be Oolong, who I I don't like him. He is like beyond perverted. Like I didn't like when he got the sleeping potion and he knocked out Goku and Bulma and he was about to touch Bulma while she was sleeping. I don't know to what extent or how far he would have got. Fortunately, and again, like this is why I don't fully mind the problematic stuff in this, is because Toriyama usually stops it before it goes too far. And Oolong didn't even get a chance to do anything with Bulma because of like the circumstances of events. It felt almost like a sitcom at times with how ridiculous some of the things would happen. Like how Yamcha and his shapeshifter friend, I'll remember everyone's names eventually. It takes me a while with names, like that's the hardest thing to remember. But Yamcha, he ends up getting his shapeshifter thing to shapeshift into Goku and distracts Oolong from doing anything else in order to try and get those Dragon Balls off them. And I liked Yamcha actually, I do. Like, I found his pursuit of getting married and just being able to talk to girls like quite cute. The way that he saw Bulma and he was just like overcome. It's kind of sweet, it's, it really is sweet. So the fact that we end the arc with those two going off together and they kind of like achieve their goals without having to rely on a dragon's wish, I kind of like that. That was like quite a, a beautiful ending for both of those in this arc. I don't know if they come back. I don't know if Bulma ends up joining Goku on his mission to collect the Dragon Balls a year after they've first been used so that when they reappear, they can get them and get the Dragon Wish. But anyway, I keep going off on a tangent. It's like hard because like, I really did enjoy this first arc and there were so many like moments that I liked. So yeah, the, the story did kind of have a structure. We went place to place and we went on our little adventures, meet new characters along the way. So yeah, we met Wulong at this village where he was terrorizing it and they've kind of blackmailed him into joining them now. They end up going to Frypan Mountain and I like that whole sequence too. I like the idea of this mountain being on fire with a castle in the middle and the Ox King wasn't as terrifying as I thought. Like we didn't really have to fight him or anything and it was his daughter Chi Chi. She ended up beheading a dinosaur which took me by surprise. I was like, oh my God. But the fact that we have this world that's a little bit random, like there are dinosaurs, but there are also cars in civilizations and like rabbit mobs and you can go to the moon. Like there are so many different things in this that is just so bizarre, but kind of works. Like I really do like the, the structure of this world. I probably like the structure of this world more than I kind of like the characters. Although I do really, really like Goku and Bulma. I think those two are my favorites. And I do like Yamcha as well. I, maybe they're my three favorites. So yeah, the Ox King wasn't as scary as I thought. And there wasn't really that many fights in this because I was expecting more fights. I imagine we will most likely get more fights moving forward, especially with Goku now training to be stronger. I think that will probably be something that comes into play a lot. But I like the connection between the Ox King and the Turtle Hermit and Goku's grandfather. Oh, you know what? Actually, I really liked Goku's connection to his grandfather, how he left him the the four dragon ball and how goku feels connected to that and that's his like kind of special thing and he, he wants to get it back and all of that so I, I like the connection there with his family and i would like to know more about his family but did he did he kill his family you know when he turns into that monster that monkey monster in like the last few chapters and he can't remember doing it he just like talks about like looking at a full moon and like his house gets destroyed his grandfather is killed like does that mean goku killed his grandfather did i read that wrong? i probably did read it wrong to be fair that was interesting but i did like the connection that he has with his grandfather how much you can tell he actually loves him and how much he like he wants to protect a, a piece of his grandfather that was left him the rabbit mob stuff was a little bit weird but again kind of worked because like a thing that even though sometimes i don't really love the whole like perverted gag kind of thing especially since there was like a chain of events with bulma losing her panties because of goku not realizing that she's like, He's innocent, okay? Like, he doesn't understand what he's doing. But, like, she does flash the turtle man without her panties on. And that leads to her end up getting a, a bunny outfit from Oolong. And the bunny outfit making people mistake her for being part of, like, the rabbit mob. And the rabbit mob also terrorizing the town. Like, there is a lot of stuff. There is a payoff to some of the earlier gags that, you know, when I first saw the bunny outfit, I was like, oh, for God's sake. Like, I don't want us to, like, sexualize Bulma. She's 16, you know what I mean? But there is, like, a story purpose at times with some of that. So, like, again, I am, like, quite forgiving and I try not to focus on it. So the whole, like, rabbit mob stuff was very random and weird. The fact that Goku can take them straight to the moon and leave them on the moon, 
what? Like, that was so random. But I liked how all that happened, and I liked how Yamcha, he has been following them because he wants the Dragon Balls. He overheard them. He wants the Dragon Balls. I love the fact that he followed them, and he ends up having to, like, save them a couple of times because, yeah, he needs them to lead him to the final Dragon Ball so they can collect them all, and then he can steal them. And he has to, like, save them a couple of times. So when the rabbit mob boss comes, and he ends up saving Bulma when she gets turned into a carrot and Goku is getting his ass beat. That was sweet. That was kind of comedic. And them all getting trapped at the end too by Pilaf. That was really funny. And I kind of like their banner. I like their group dynamic in a way. Especially since Yamcha is like trying to rob them. He's going to rob them at the end of this. But he's also helping them along the way. It's just such a funny juxtaposition. So there was a lot of random stuff. And then I was like, well, why is this arc called the Emperor Pilaf arc? If nobody called Pilaf has appeared. And then he finally does appear in the last few chapters. And he has the last Dragon Ball. He manages to steal all of them off them. You know what, there was a moment in volume two where he breaks the fourth wall and it's kind of funny. And I kind of like how he's turning the whole like perviness on its head too. Especially when the girl is with, she makes a crude joke about like a ball, it being between the men's legs kind of thing. And Pilaf says, you know, we do not appreciate vulgar humor here. After all, some manga creators strive to make their work dignified and refined. If you think we'll pander to our audience's shameful love of pee pee, caca humor simply to boost the sales of the Dragon Ball comic, then you are very sadly mistaken. I just kind of love that wall break. I kind of love that Toriyama had this moment there because yeah, like sometimes there have been some crude things happen before now and you've seen a little bit too much. And I kind of just like the self-awareness of it. And it, again, it just adds to the unseriousness of the series so far. And I like the story at this point too. He's got them captured. He manages to summon the dragon and all of that. I just genuinely wasn't expecting it to happen this quickly. And now for all the balls to be dispelled across the universe, and now they're gonna have to recollect them all. Well, Goku is, but I don't know. I, I I hope Bulma rejoins him. I know she now has a boyfriend and that's what she was gonna wish for, which is a little bit shallow, but you know what? You gotta do what you gotta do. But before that though, yeah, when, when Goku turns into that monster, I was so shocked. I didn't even realize that was a thing he could do. But now I'm wondering what consequences there are from that happening and is taking his tail off gonna be a huge consequence of that? Like, is he able to do it again? Or is that like stripping away like the last of his monkey powers? If he has monkey powers, I don't know. I just know he's like very strong and he could turn into a big ass monkey. But now he doesn't have his tail, he's losing his balance. And I think for the next year, he will be like training up with the pervert hermit and getting stronger and better. And I don't think Goku cares about the wish from the dragon. I think he just wants that four Dragon Ball back so that he can have that part of his grandfather again. I think that's his mission now, like his quest in Godspeed. Godspeed to him. So I would probably give the first arc of Dragon Ball 5 out of 10. It was maybe a little bit too random for me. I still really liked a lot of the humor, despite some of the things kind of dampening my enjoyment of it. But overall, I think the story was really good. I loved the introduction of the characters. I really liked the world and I can't wait to explore more of that. And I think 5 out of 10, you know, it's halfway. I can imagine we only get better from here. And I'm really excited to see what Goku does next. I love that we're going in the right direction for this series. I really did enjoy the whole tournament aspect of the tournament arc. It was a little bit hit and miss for me to begin with. I was a little bit unsure because I did think the whole training stuff lasted maybe just a little bit too long. Although to be fair, in terms of like realism, I guess, although how realistic can you be in this kind of series? But all the tasks that Goku and Kurarin Kurarin? I want to look up so badly the pronunciations of some of these names, but I don't want to get spoiled for anything in the future. But Kurarin, I love Goku and Kurarin. I love how they end up becoming like brothers in arms almost. Like they become so close and they cheer each other on later on in the tournament part of this when they're looking for the strongest under the heavens. And they're just on the sidelines like, you can do it. That was so cool. That was amazing. And I'm kind of sad that they seem to have parted ways at the end of this arc and Goku has gone off on his adventure on his own because I kind of would have loved to have seen Kurin and Goku get a little bit closer and become like the best of friends and more like brothers you know I think that would have been like so cool to see I mean there is still time they might still bump into each other every now and then because you know we got Oolong we got Bulma we got Yamcha. I'm really starting to get everyone's names, but they all come back for this arc too because they're all watching it. Well, Yamcha is part of the tournament, but everyone else is watching. And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. We've got like a little bit of a family reunion from the first arc. And I love seeing Bummer again. Didn't love seeing Oolong again, but you know, like he was tolerable in this arc. He didn't really do anything to 
outwardly creepy and perverted. Can't say the same thing about the master though. I didn't love the start of this arc where we had the master telling Goku, oh you need to go and find me a busty woman or like a hottie and bring her back. I didn't like the whole like kidnapping women thing just so that guy can like perv on them. Really didn't like that. Also didn't like when he touched the flight attendant's arse. That wasn't cool. He really does too much, you know. Uh, so I, I still don't really like him all that much. I don't know if we'll probably see him again after this arc. It does seem like he's done his purpose by training Goku and Kuririn, which is great because I do feel like what he taught them has actually helped because they were so surprised when they got to the tournament and they were really strong and they didn't even realize it. Like I kind of like that kind of realization that their strength has definitely developed over the past year. And I will give the master kudos for giving such a performance in the tournament against, well, a few people, but like he defeated Yamcha, he defeated Kuririn, and he just barely defeated Goku. So like for an old man, yes, he is fantastically strong and he still has it. I would love to change other things about it, but I know that's kind of like manga humor sometimes and this is a product of its time. So I'm not trying to like penalize it too much. And I did love when the master gave that guy, the you know, the guy who came from the village and they need like water and stuff to save the village and he was like fighting for his village but he lost. Namu, uh, he was fantastic, a great fighter. A little bit sad that he lost but you know it did have to happen so that Goku could progress and it was a really good fight and actually I think it was like one of the first fights in the series where I was like, oh, this is kind of what I expected Dragon Ball to be because the first arc kind of lacked the fights. It was a lot more humorous than I expected. But this arc, I think, is giving me a taste of what to expect in the future when it comes to the fights. And I loved all of that, but I did love the master giving Namu a capsule so that he can get as much water as he possibly can to give back to his village. So that was nice. I will give him points for that. And he did turn out to be extremely helpful in Goku's pursuit suit of getting stronger so that by the time the Dragon Ball quest begins he will be able to handle it no problem. There were some moments like early on in this arc that I enjoyed as their training such as like when the master writes on that rock and throws it and Kuririn kind of steals it off Goku and Goku like try to get it the right way but Kuririn tries to like cheat a couple of times and he ends up succeeding in cheating but all of them get food poisoning because Goku doesn't get to have dinner because he lost the game even though he didn't actually lose it really. I love the fact that Karma came for him quick. I kind of liked lunch. Like lunch was a little bit weird. Every time she sneezed she changed personality and one side of her was like this really lovely person and the other side of her was like this gun torting horrible person who was just like shooting them whenever she wanted to. I kind of like that. That was kind of funny. And sometimes in the aftermath of training such as when they're tied to the tree and there are the bees and the master like runs away just as he swats the bees nest and all the bees come and they have to like dodge them while tied to this tree. It's so funny when you see them all like stung afterwards. Like it's such unorthodox training, but it works. And it, it's kind of funny to, to see that. But yes, the whole tournament section of it was very exciting. Getting all of like the brackets and all of the, the matches and seeing how each person fights. Because there were so many different fighting styles. There was one guy who was absolutely gross and vile. Bacterian, I think vile, disgusting, but I laughed so much when he's fighting Kuririn and Kuririn realizes, oh, I don't have a nose. Like I shouldn't be able to smell any of this. That was really funny. As much as I did find the first arc quite funny, I thought this one was just a little bit more funny. So I love the fact that we're keeping the humor and up in the ante when it comes to the fights. But genuinely, I think the best part of this arc was that fight between Goku and his master with them not realizing that he is actually their master. That lasted so long and it was was honestly riveting throughout. Every single time they kind of got thrown out of the arena and if you touch down on the ground outside the arena then you lose. But the amount of times that they would do something a little bit creative to get back, such as Goku using his monkey's tail which has grown back and it grew back at the most opportune time. Love the fact that he used it as a helicopter to get back on. Loved it when the master came off the arena but he had his foot wedged into like the concrete somehow like oh my god these characters are so strong it's insane it's hilarious and getting back to the fight when Goku sees the full moon and he changes into that big monkey monster leading to the master blasting the moon away like what like will that not have some like repercussions for the earth will that not have repercussions for gravity or anything it's so absurd and so silly and I freaking ate it up and I was really rooting for Goku to beat his master but at the same time I'm like it's still quite early in the series and the master does raise a good point that if they do end up 
thinking that they're the best, then they're not going to want to train as much or, you know, like they still have a long journey to go and it just feels like it's probably a bit too soon to have such a big epic win this early on. So yeah, I kind of am a little bit glad that Goku lost to the master, but I do love the fact that it was so fractionally close that it was just so riveting all the way through. You think the match is gonna be over, and then it isn't. You think the match is gonna be over again, but then it isn't. It's just so good. And then I do love the ending. I do love the idea of Goku going off on his adventure again. And one thing I do miss from this arc that I really loved in the first arc is that sense of adventure. It's one of the reasons why I love things like One Piece, for instance. I love quests, I love adventure stories, and I love that we're going back to that with this. And I do feel like the tournament arc was a nice little change from the first arc. I feel like I got more of a sense of the identity of the series from this and just promises to, I guess, like get even better from here on out. So I would probably give this arc maybe a 6.5 out of 10. I will probably revisit a lot of the ratings that I give the arcs at the end of this video. I think once I've seen the full picture and I kind of get a sense of what Dragon Ball is all about and I find my own feet with the series, I might change my mind on what I gave each arc. But yeah, for now, I think a 6.5 is pretty decent actually. Such a fun arc and it made me really glad that I'm reading this series. I am done with the Red Ribbon Army arc and I think I'm going based off of the anime in terms of like the seasons because I'm trying to find out more about like the actual arc structure. So this was the shortest one so far with 15 chapters and it was another good one. It was a banger. It was a lot of fun. I don't think I liked it as much as the tournament arc but just slightly. So I think I will give this one a 6 out of 10 but I wonder if the Red Ribbon Army are going to be like the big antagonists for the rest of the Dragon Ball series because we do have Goku going off on his adventure and he manages to find the Dragon Balls with his tracker that Bulma made and there are already people looking for the Dragon Balls, this Red Ribbon Army. And we first come across Colonel Silver and like so far the Red Ribbon Army seem a little bit farcical, a little bit like they do try to stop Goku but he's just like too good for them. Every single time somebody goes up against him, Goku does wipe the floor with them in quite a comedic fashion. But we do meet Commander Red and Commander Red seems rather intense, although he does seem to be a little bit sensitive about his size. He does seem a little bit smaller than the people around him. But the idea that the Red Ribbon Army are trying to get these Dragon Balls while Goku is also looking for them at stakes and that's kind of what I was maybe missing in the previous two arcs is that I didn't really feel the stakes. I mean Emperor Pilaf that whole thing was pretty good like I like the way that the first arc ended that did have a little bit of stakes but now I feel like there is this sort of race a race to get the rest of the Dragon Balls and we have this enemy after us so I really enjoy that. I love when Goku goes to the White Squad base because I love the snowy setting it reminds me a little bit of like Drum Island and One Piece and again like I'm going to probably mention One Piece every now and then when I say the similarities because also the tower, the, the, the base that Goku gets into reminded me a little bit of Impel Down with like the different levels and the different like enemies on each level kind of thing. It very loosely reminded me of Impel Down. But the whole snowy set in itself is so good. I love the village. I love the fact that it was a little girl who dragged Goku into her home to pretty much save him from the cold. And the fact that it was Goku's first time seeing snow. Like again, sometimes I forget just how innocent and unaware he is. And then he sees snow for the first time and he doesn't really like <laughs> jump up with joy or anything like it. Like he doesn't really know what it is, just like water. So he just continues on his way. But it's just so cool to see him have these first experiences. And when he fights that guy in front of the little girl and she's like, what did you just do? And he's like, um, six punches and four kicks. Like he takes things so literally. It's just so funny. I really do like the fights on the levels in the tower too. That ninja person who kept trying to hide was so ridiculous but it kept making me laugh the way that I was trying to hide behind the flag and then turned it around because it was like the wrong way around. That was funny. But when he tried to hide in the water, but the fact that Goku goes inside to get a kettle filled with hot water to put in the water instead of just like grabbing the bamboo so that he couldn't breathe. You know, like there were just so many different things that made me laugh so much in this. So I do really feel like we've hit our stride with the humor. I think there was maybe some growing pains with the first arc and going into the second arc. But I think we really are like finding our feet now in terms of like how silly we are becoming, but also juxtaposing that with the seriousness of the situations, the fights, and I, I love it. I mean, I say the seriousness of the fights. That long ass fight with a ninja and getting the whole like quintuplets part of it and the way that Goku finally does take him down. It's just, that whole fight was so unserious. Same with the Jiggler. Like it's so unserious, but 
Again, like, I, I enjoy that. Oh, but Mechanical Man number eight has my entire heart. Oh my gosh, I will die for him. I will, I love him. I love when he said to Goku that he's his best friend. And the mayor saying that he is gonna like pretty much adopt him and A-Man says, oh, but I'm not real. And the mayor says, a better man than most of the real people I know. Oh, and then he calls him daddy and the mayor calls him son. Oh my God, like that I love. I feel like that was the most heart that I've seen in the series so far. And it was so beautiful. And this is the Viz translation, by the way. I'm sorry if there are like errors in, in character names. So if I am wrong with any of the names, please let me know down below. But I think it's Eight Man. And when he won't fight Goku, when he first gets out of his little jail cell, and he says, it's bad to kill, I don't like bad. Mm. And then he says, if I have to be bad, I want to be blowed up. Oh, he's amazing. I love him. Oh, I do hope Goku goes back and sees him. I hope he keeps his promise because he's my best friend now. Here's my best friend. <laughs> Going back to the ninja stuff though, I do have a full list of notes and stuff as I go through. Going back to the ninja stuff, one, when the ninja makes him count to 30 and he goes to hide. Like the whole hide and seek thing again made me laugh so much, but it was so unserious. And then when Goku's staff goes like right up his ass, I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck am I reading? But also that's my kind of fight. Oh, but I did fall in love with A Man. I do feel like I am just loving the characters even more. Goku and Bulma too. I'm so glad we got to see Bulma at the end of this arc and that she is now accompanying Goku again on this adventure. Adventures are better shared with friends. So I like the fact that she's tagging along. Although is there trouble in paradise between Bulma and Yamcha? You know, I was rooting for them. I do hope that she doesn't want a better boyfriend. I hope that's not the only reason that she's going with Goku. I hope she just wants an adventure and doesn't actually want to wish for a, a better boyfriend. So I can imagine we'll probably say Yamcha and Oolong again pretty soon. But it was amazing seeing Bulma's house too. Like, wow, Bulma, her dad being the creator, the inventor of the capsules, amazing. I uh, love the fact that Bulma is so clever that she can fix the tracker for the Dragon Balls. Like, I know she invented it and stuff, but like to be able to be the only person to fix it because the eight man can't fix it, but she can. I love how smart and how resourceful she is. And that watch thing she has to make herself small, that's incredible too. Like she's a genius. So I loved seeing the City of the West. I love how different it was to the Snowy Village. I love seeing different areas and locations. It's one of my favorite things about One Piece is seeing all the different islands and how vastly different each island is too. Like you can get a snowy island one minute and then a desert island the next. It's kind of the same with Dragon Ball. I really do feel like you can travel across so many different places in this world and come across so many different cultures and experiences and people and it's fantastic. It's the thing I'm probably loving the most in Dragon Ball so far. I really do like the fights. I like how humorous it is. I'm really starting to love the characters and I just love the setting. It's so good. So yay, off to find more Dragon Balls now and it's gonna be so funny because we end the arc with the narrator. Sometimes I love the narrator just like breaking the fourth wall to let us know what's going on and the narrator says, oh, but Goku didn't tell Bulma about the Red Ribbon Army. So like that's gonna lead to some hijinks, I am sure. Okay, I know General Blue is a bad guy. I think I can fix him. And what's great as well is that I am actually going to Egypt in November. So who knows, I might see him there. I love the whole deep sea diving adventure that we went on. I love the fact that we started it out as well with Bulma realizing that she took the wrong capsule. It's her dad's capsule and it's just all dirty magazines. Like, God, that's just typical, isn't it? Just absolutely typical. And I love the fact that we did get to the island with the master on. And Kururin, I think I say his name differently every single time, but love the reunion with Kururin. But the master asks for the watch that Bulma made to shrink you. And he tries to use that against Bulma by sneaking into the bathroom, but she's already finished and he falls into the toilet, gets flushed down. I love the fact that, again, karma hit him straight away. That was pretty funny. But it was the reunion with Kuririn that I genuinely bloody loved. And he was with us for the majority of this arc as well. He ends up going with Bulma and Goku to the bottom of the ocean. And I love seeing all of that get illustrated. I haven't really mentioned much about the illustration style. It is a little bit older, but I kind of love that. It makes it feel a lot more like authentic manga, vintage manga, I guess. It's kind of a little bit cozy. I, I don't know how to describe that, but yes, all of the underwater stuff was pretty fantastic. Love the fact that General Blue was chasing after them. He's a bit of a perfectionist and he has this like telekinesis power. And I thought like telekinesis was like moving objects with your mind, but I guess his version of it is he can keep the object in place. He's got control over the object, I think maybe. So I kind of like the fact that he gave Goku a run for his money. Felt bad for Kuro 
Fuhrerin, who was fighting against him in front of Bulma in the underwater like cave thing with the pirate treasure. Oh my god, the pirate stuff was great. We got pirate bones, pirate treasure. Like, what more could you want? Like, the more I'm talking about it, the more I kind of want to bump my rating up for this. But it really was imbued with a lot of that old school adventure. Almost a little bit like the Goonies in a little way. Just the way that it kind of came across as with like the bad guy chasing them. Trying to get the Dragon Balls and them trying to escape that person. Going through the traps. Finding the treasure. It just was so good. Yeah, the fight between General Blue and Kuririn was pretty good. I felt bad for Kuririn because he couldn't really keep up with General Blue, which I'm a little bit surprised at, especially with how amazingly strong Kuririn was during the tournament a couple of arcs ago. But it really does show the power of General Blue and how powerful he was and how he was actually kind of a match for Goku. And I don't know if it's true or not, but Bulma trying to use her sexuality to influence general blue and be like oh my god he's hot hey what do you think of me kind of thing and he's like ew disgusting and she's like oh he must be gay and uh Kuriman's like i didn't realize that could be gay bad guys i kind of love that whole exchange it probably was just for laughs and probably just a joke but when i say i'm available general blue i'm even wearing blue i think that's fate and the fact that general blue was taken down by a rat really because he could have killed goku right there and then but because he saw a rat he kind of lost control and that ended up saving goku's life i love the fact that goku saved the rat as well he was like, you saved my life, now hop into my mouth. And then it gets them out of the cave as it's like coming down. <gasps> like, I love that so much. The fact that Goku felt like he owed this little rodent and acknowledges him for saving his life. That was beautiful. I love that so much. I am a little bit confused by the whole like penguin village bit. Well, not exactly confused, but like it happened pretty quickly. So yeah, they did get the three star Dragon Ball and then General Blue pounced on them when they least expected it, which was great considering it was against the master and Goku and everyone. So I really just show you how pretty powerful General Blue is in a way. Probably not like the most powerful, of course, but like still pretty good. I thought it was really funny actually when he leaves the bomb and Bulma's like, hey, do you not need like a girl on the Red Ribbon Army? And he's like, no, we don't have girls. And then the master's like, what about old men? And like everyone's like, what? And like, you're gonna leave them to save your own skin? I found that pretty funny. Yeah, so Goku does go after General Blue and he crashes. He gets the Dragon Balls back. He ends up breaking the tracker. So yeah, we uh, land in Penguin Village when Goku catches up with General Blue. And there are these like little kids. They have like these little wings. I, I, I don't know how to describe them because we keep getting introduced to these like different places and these different people without really like stopping to ask questions kind of. We kind of have to just like accept what happens when we get to each place and just kind of like know what's going on, which is uh, maybe I just need to watch like the anime or something to help me see everything, especially with the characters there. I don't really understand them, but like one of them was like a genius. They go to the, the house and the person fixes the tracker so that Goku can have it, but then General Blue steals it. But then one of the kids knocks General Blue all the way to freaking Egypt. And the other kid makes Goku a brand new tracker. I was just like, okay, okay. Uh, that was very quick, very sudden, but yay, we have a tracker. We've got the Dragon Balls back. Now we can just mosey on to try and get the four star ball, which will most likely end up being the very last one that Goku ends up getting. So I think another pretty solid arc, actually. I'll give it six out of 10 again, just like the previous arc. I'm not too sure which one I prefer. So far, that's what I'm feeling. I still feel like there is so much potential and we're just like so close to hitting that potential with Dragon Ball and I'm just like not quite there yet. But it is the Commander Red arc next who was introduced a couple of arcs ago. But I think we're now like halfway through the Red Ribbon Army saga which is pretty awesome. So we'll continue on. Hoping maybe the next arc or thereafter gets a seven or above. Well, shit got real talk real quick. How do we have, I think three pretty brutal deaths in this arc after what we've had previously. It just got so dark. Oh, my heart broke because General Blue, he died like pretty much at the very start of this arc because of that goddamn assassin. I was like, oh. I guess I won't see him in Egypt this November anymore. I think it just solidified at the very start of this arc that this assassin was not screwing around. But did the assassin take General Blue out with a lick? He just whipped his tongue out and he was down. And then the assassin just like gets a pillar, like he just takes it off the building and throws it and gets on it. And he goes thousands of miles and minutes. It's insanity. It's absolute insanity. But we do end up at the Karen Sanctuary. That's where we predominantly spent 
this arc and I honestly loved it. I thought this was a great arc. I love the fact that we had this fight with the assassin and Goku couldn't quite take him down. In fact, he looked dead. Oh my god, but the poor dad. I think it's Bora and Upe is his daughter and Goku saves Upe so Bora has the four ball Dragon Ball, which is Grandpa's Dragon Ball. So I'm like, oh my god, we achieved our goal at the start of this. There is death. There is amazing fights. I was like, this is definitely my favorite arc so far. And I thought, oh, well, I guess Goku's not gonna go looking for the rest of the Dragon Balls. But now he has a, a true purpose of getting these Dragon Balls now. Like a very honorable purpose. So the assassin comes, kills Bora. I was heartbroken. That was just awful. And he seemed like such a nice guy. And he was gonna protect Goku as well, but nope death. So now I love the fact that Goku's mission, his quest, is to ask the dragon to bring Bora back to life. Like that is going to be his wish. So even though he got his his goal, he got the, the four Dragon Ball, the one that his grandpa gave him, now he has a reason to collect the other ones. I think that was like so clever on Toriyama's part in writing this manga and keeping Goku in the quest game. Otherwise he would have just turned around and gone home because he achieved his mission. He's got his grandfather's ball. So I love that we incorporated that. But like Goku going up that massive tower and meets the hermit master at the top and that whole exchange and the way that he trained for three days there and the fact it took the previous master, the, the turtle guy, Goku's master, three years to get the water, whereas it takes Goku three days to get it. I love that. I love the fact that it wasn't actually magic water too. So apparently there was like the legend that if you drink the water at the top, it makes you so strong. But it actually turns out that the human master is training Goku by like throwing the ball down to the bottom. So Goku has to go all the way back to the top in record time as well. And you know, all of the training there, trying to read moves as well, because it brings up a good point. Goku is very reactionary. He doesn't really read moves. He just like fights willy nilly and he just like does what he wants to do. But the Hermit Master really does teach him to read his opponent. And that's what he does with the assassin when he comes back. He gets the assassin to exact all of his moves. And then Goku's like, okay, I know all your moves now. So here we go. And it's just so great. It's so genius. Like Goku is actually smarter than I realized. Like he's actually like a really great character. So then he kills the assassin. So that's like three. Oh wait, no. So there must be like four or five deaths in this then. So yeah, he kills the assassin with like the bomb thing that the assassin throws him. And then Goku goes all the way to the Red Ribbon Army headquarters to take them all down himself. I love the fact that his friends, so like Bulma and the Master and Yamcha, I love the fact that they're going to help Goku. And Yamcha is the one who wrangles them all up as well. And he's like, well, hasn't Goku saved all of your lives at least once? So like, we're going to do this. We're going to save him. But it turns out that he didn't actually need to because Goku himself managed to take down the whole freaking headquarters himself. And it was incredible to watch. It was incredible to see him infiltrated, just take down everyone. But oh my God, Commander Black or General Black or whoever he is, shooting the Commander Red in the forehead because he finds out that he sacrificed so many lives because he wants to use the wish to get taller, which I, I felt something was gonna happen with his size. But I was shocked. I was shooketh when Commander Black just shoots Commander Red right in the forehead and he's dead. Just point blank just straight the fuck down. I was like, oh my God, this is some dark shit. And I was eating it up. I was living for it. So Commander Black does end up having two of the Dragon Balls. So now Goku has six Dragon Balls. Oh, I think my cats are fighting or something. I apologize if there's any noise in the background. So now he has six of the seven. So there's only one Dragon Ball left to go. And honestly, I think this is the point in the series where I'm like, okay, I'm all in. Like, I seriously love this now. I love the adventure. I love the characters. I'm really invested now. I want to see Goku get that final Dragon Ball. I want him to bring back Bora. I want him to bring him back to life. I really hope the dragon can do that. I'm just all in. I'm just invested. I'm all in. I, I, I can't wait to read the rest of this. So I'm going to give this arc an 8 out of 10. I still think there is still greatness to come, but I loved so many moments from this. I think this is definitely the turning point for me personally in the series. I thought it was so good. So action-packed. So... Great. I love the different set pieces. I love the big tower and the Hermit Master, the Assassin and everything. Like it was so good. Oh, another death actually as well. The tailor who gives the Assassin his clothes, like he just dies as well. I felt so bad for him too. Oh my God. Like this was filled with death. And I freaking love that. I mean, I still love the balance with the humor because Goku was still very funny. So I love that. Like when he tells the Hermit Master to look 
And obviously the Hermit Master like can read his mind so he knows it's a trick. But yeah, I found that like a funny little moment. But the last battle with Commander Black and uh, Goku stopping him was just great. It was fantastic. Love that so much. So yeah, 8 out of 10 for that arc. And you never know again, like things might change. Things might get bumped up. Things might come down depending on the rest of the arcs. But honestly, this was a turning point that I needed to be all in. Right, I have finished the Fortune Teller Barber arc, which I think also means I finished the Red Ribbon Army saga. And it was another really good arc, and I'm not 100% sure what to rate it, honestly. I definitely think the rating's gonna change after this. At the minute, I'm thinking maybe a seven out of 10. That might be a little high though, because I don't know if I prefer this over the tournament arc. Overall, at least, I don't know. One of the reasons why I love this arc is because we had a little bit of incorporation of the Universal Classic Monsters. So the story of this arc is Goku trying to find that last Dragon Ball, but he can't find it because Pilaf, uh, we have Pilaf coming back and he has it in like some sort of container. So they can't track it on the tracker. So they go to the uh, all Saiyan Crone, who turns out to be the master's sister in order to find out where the last Dragon Ball is. And because they can't pay for it, they have to fight for it. And the five people slash monsters that they have to fight are like Dracula, the Invisible Man. I thought that, that was great. The fact that we were getting these universe monsters and the mummy as well. Don't forget the mummy. I love that whole cesspit kind of a battle sequence there. Love that Yamcha, really fought like so hard. That was really awesome. I really did like the whole fight sequences with the mummy. Obviously Goku is the one who ends up defeating the mummy and the devil as well, that was pretty cool. But that was when it started to be like not the universal monsters. Cause I don't think there was a universal monster of the devil, was there? I guess I could be wrong on that. But then the last person, the masked person, oh my God, turns out to be Goku's friggin' grandfather. I was so shocked. I thought, oh, is he actually alive? But no, it turns out he's just there for the day. And the salary is good, fighting for the old Saiyan crone. And I love that. I love that reunion so much. The fight was really good. I love that he really put a focus on Goku's tail and the fact that he hasn't been trained in the tail and the tail is his weakness. You know, if you grab it, he loses his strength. So obviously Pilaf says that, but then the tail goes away so that he can't use the tail against Goku when he does come face to face with him. There were so many great little connections in this arc and it led to really great moments by the end of it. So I liked Kuririn's fight with the Dracula person, although it was absolutely sick. It made me feel a little bit nauseous when Dracula's teeth were in his head and it was like spurting blood. Ugh, like that was disgusting. So obviously like he would lose. A little bit surprised that he lost so easily and quickly, but I would probably lose too if I was losing a lot of blood. So it's great that Upa, and you know what, I think I might have said Upa was a girl before. Upa's a boy, Upa is a boy, but I think I said daughter or, or girl in the previous arc, so forgive me. Upa and Pia, Pure, pure, pure. Those two end up going together to take down the Dracula one. That was good. Invisible Man fight was good, but I did not love Kuririn pulling down Bulma's shirt to expose her bra, causing the master to like spurt blood from his nose. A lot of blood in this arc, apparently. It does help to expose the Invisible Man, so that was good. And then, yep, Yamcha won. The mummy fight was fantastic, I love that. Devil fight was good too, and oh, Goku, like, he tries to use this, like, evil in your heart kind of power move, like the devil, but Goku's heart is too pure and innocent. There is no evil inside him, so I love the fact that, I think it was the master who said, is he really pure and innocent or is his mind just empty kind of thing? It's very hard to understand which one sometimes, but I really like that, I like that fight. And then yeah, with the fight with the grandfather, fantastic, love that so much. And the reunion was so special and so sweet. Like I wanted to cry alongside Goku. I was like, oh, this is so wholesome. And I was really surprised that Pilaf had come back and he did have the last Dragon Ball. I was like, oh God, not this Bozo again. But amazing that Goku managed to gather all of the Dragon Balls and defeat Pilaf and his cronies again. They're so comical. It's almost a little bit like Team Rocket in a way, like the way that Pilaf is with these two little henchmen. They are just taken down so easy. It's like almost not even worth mentioning them because of how easy it is to take them down. They're just like a nuisance more than anything. But yeah, I'm so glad Goku managed to get the last one and resurrect Bora. That was so fantastic. I was so happy. My emotions are definitely involved in this series now. And Goku did manage to grab the four star Dragon Ball before they disappeared and scattered. But now I guess the future of the Dragon Ball original series, although I do know 
that Dragon Ball Z is actually part of the original Dragon Ball. It's just, I think, everywhere else they split into different series, whereas in Japan it's just like one continuous series. But yeah, it seems like the tournament for the strongest under heaven is happening again, and that is going to be the next saga's kind of big story, I think. And considering how much I enjoyed the tournament arc, I think I will enjoy the next saga a lot. But yeah, I guess like not a whole lot to say about the arc. I'm just enjoying the fights a lot, enjoying like more character work coming through and getting to enjoy the characters more and liking their personalities, for the most part anyway. Goku being like the best, the absolute best. But also, oh, really interesting as well, the Crone said that Goku will save the world one day. And I'm like, oh, interesting. What does he have to save the world from? Like, what's that all about? Is something gonna threaten the world by the end of this series? By the end of this series or Dragon Ball Z, I would like to know. So now Goku has gone off, three years passing, and he's gonna try and learn about life, I think. So maybe he might come back with a little bit more, I guess, common sense or just a bit more awareness of the world around him that he didn't really have before. So he might be a little bit more intelligent or something like that when we come back. I do think he has like smarts in a totally different way in the series thus far. But yeah, he does lack a lot of like common sense kind of skills. So it'll be really interesting to see how 3S has changed him. How can he possibly get any more powerful and stronger? I have no idea. Excited to see that too. Excited to see if Yamcha and Kuririn are stronger also by learning under the master for the last three years too. So yeah, so much to look forward to in terms of the characters, seeing where they've ended up. Good little end to that arc and saga, I guess. So yeah, seven out of 10 at the minute feels pretty right to me. Kuririn is not dead. I had a message one of my friends about this and they were like, Kuririn, who? And I was like, you know, Kuririn, Goku's like best friend. And they're like, oh, Krillin. So I think Krillin is his name in the anime. So I'm so sorry if I've been saying his name wrong. Like this is Zoro all over again, but I'll continue to say Kuririn, or even though it's a little bit hard for me to say with all the vowels. How can we end that arc with Kuririn going inside to get the Dragon Ball for Goku and them going in and finding them dead? Oh my god, I, that was really, really shocking. I think ever since the Commander Red arc, Dragon Ball is just taking this really dark turn. But now I'm wondering, my theory is, and this is definitely a theory that was answered like 40 years ago, but like my theory is that now we have to go on this Dragon Ball quest again to get all the Dragon Balls and maybe Goku will resurrect Kuririn. That would be pretty cool. There is like a little bit of repetition with the way that this series is uh, because this whole arc, the Ten Shinhan arc, I'm so sorry if I said that wrong too. You guys are probably shouting at me with all of the correct pronunciations. This arc was pretty much a, I guess a sequel to the tournament arc from earlier in the series, except now we're seeing three years of progress for not just Goku, but Kuririn and even the master. The master himself has been training. Oh, and Yamcha, Yamcha as well. So it was really cool to touch base again after so long to see how far they've come. And I love tournaments. Tournaments are a great kind of plot device sometimes. And I think it's done really well in Dragon Ball. It really does showcase the immense power and battle strategy of the opponents. And I think that's like so much fun. I read One Piece mainly for like the story and the world building. And Dragon Ball does do that every now and then. But I think this is definitely more to do with like the fighting and the battles, which is something that I'm kind of really enjoying. I didn't think I would 100% love it because battles isn't really my kind of thing. But actually seeing it in Dragon Ball and seeing how different it is each time is so much fun to read. And just when I think someone's gonna be out for the count or it's over, they end up standing back up and continue fighting. And they pull out moves from nowhere that I didn't even realize they could do. And it was so good, like Goku making himself kind of invisible, but not exactly invisible. He's just like going really fast and it looks like he is. And that was so much fun. But I guess the main premise and the story of this is that we have the Crane Master, who is sort of the antagonist. And he is a rival of the Turtle Master, or Master, who I still will never remember his name. And he probably has a totally different name anyway that people call him from the bonker. But it was really cool to see the Kray Master and his own students and them being up against our characters, our main characters. And you know what? I ended up really enjoying those characters by the end of it. The Crane Master, not so much. He was awful. He was evil. But I did love his two students. So we had Ten Shinhan. I love the fact that he had that third eye and he looked a little bit scary to begin with. And then when he grows those arms out of his back, although I think that was more like an illusion kind of thing, 
Honestly, sometimes I think I'm not fast enough to keep up with the fights, honestly. But he does, like, roll them out of his back, which don't stay there. They go back inside. Either they go back inside or it was just, like, an illusion with, like, how fast he's moving or something. A little bit like how Goku did that with his arms, too. Tension Hand looked like... Machamp from Pokemon. <laughs> so I kind of like that. And the other one that we meet who is the Crane Master student is Chozu, Chozu. And he has some kind of psychic abilities, does kind of get in our way a few times. But I loved that Kuririn defeated Chozu and how we ended up getting a fight between Goku and uh, Kuririn because that was such a good fight. I love how you know, brothers in arms they are. I love their dynamics so much. I love how they're both excited to fight one another. Like, they're really happy and proud of each other at how far they've come, but also, like, they're not holding back. And it was a really good and fun fight. I felt so bad for Yamcha because he doesn't really last too long in the tournament. He does seem to still get out pretty relatively early on in them. But, oof, the way his leg looked after the fight he had, oh. That looked really painful. I hope he's okay, because he ends up getting taken to hospital, so I hope he's fine. You know, now we have Kuririn potentially dead, and then Yamcha in the hospital. Damn, like, our characters went through it in this arc. The fight between the master and the man-wolf was pretty good. I like the fact that the master getting rid of the moon came back to bite him in the bum, and he had someone who hates him because he did that. That was a nice little moment. I love lunch as well, changing her personalities, having her gun and being like, I'll get us the best seats in the house. That was really funny. And also when she talks to Tension Han and it's like, I like your savagery. I love the fight between Kuririn and Chaozu. I liked how Kuririn got him to count on his hands. He kept giving math problems. And because he realizes, oh, he's using his hands to do his psychic powers trick or whatever it is that he does. And so he reads those moves and he has this really clever way of stopping him from doing it. I thought that was really good. I love the fact that Goku also did the whole like reading of the moves and the fact that he was watching Tension Han fight and he managed to get the sunglasses off the master to stop the blinding light move or whatever it's called. I'm not going to be good with any of the battle move names or anything, but just know that I do really enjoy what's happening on the page. It's very fast, but still fun to read nonetheless. I just won't be technical because I never remember battle name moves or anything like that. I'm only just starting to get good at the character names, and even then I think I'm wrong nine times out of ten. The master's fight with Tension Han was also pretty epic, and I was kind of a bit confused at first when the master jumps into the out of bounds zone and ends the fight, which means Tension Han does win. So I was a little bit confused by that to begin with, but I did like his sort of speech to Tension Han and the fact that he feels like he's not really needed anymore, like the next generation are going to be fine. And the fact that those words really affected Tension Han later on during his fight with Goku, that he managed to stop the crane master from cheating and getting Chaozu to cheat while he's fighting. That does show a lot of nobility. It shows a lot of honesty. And that's really good because he did come across as a bit of a villain to begin with. But I kind of love the fact that he took the master's words on board and he's like, oh, I don't want to be an assassin anymore. And I'm like, okay, I'm kind of interested to see where your character arc goes from here. If he's even still around. I think he's too good of a character to let up though. I think we should have more of him in the future. And I wonder if maybe, because like, yeah, my theory now is that Goku is going to have to try and find a way to save Kuririn and maybe Tension Han will join him on that adventure. That would be really awesome. Oh, I also loved when Goku trained his tail. So he has been spending the last three years training his tail. Kuririn tried to use the tail move of like grabbing it so that he would take advantage of his weakness. But yeah, it doesn't really look like Goku has a lot of weaknesses. Maybe his honesty can be a weakness sometimes, but I think it's also like incredibly endearing. It's something that I really admire in Luffy, in One Piece, for example, and it's something that I really love in Goku. And especially when you see how much is rubbing off on the other characters too, especially like Ten Shinhan, I feel like he might stick around, you know, he might have a lot to learn from Goku. Like, he's a really incredible fighter. When he blasts away the entire arena and destroys it, that was incredible. And I'm kind of sad that Goku lost, and it was, like, so close. But I guess this means there might be another tournament arc where we see Goku win, finally, maybe. If that even happens in this, it might happen in Dragon Ball Z. I'm invested, though. I really do want to see him win. He was so close. I was so frustrated. But I still loved the entire experience. I thought it was really good. I think this is my favorite arc so far, and I... I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10, but I'm also going to lower Commander Red arc down to a 7.5 out of 10, because I do think this one edges it just slightly, and as much as I love the more adventure element of the Commander Red arc, I was just blown away by all the fights in this arc. I love tournament settings. 
That ending though, with Guerin, I'm just, ah, oh, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to think about it. I can't fully believe that he's actually dead. I already know the first chapter of the next arc is the death of Guerin because it's literally right there. Like this is where I finished the arc and the reading and then boom, straight there. I'm gonna have to continue reading like ASAP because I can't let him be dead. I can't let him stay dead in my mind. This, it, it's not right. <laughs> That was like the best arc so far, 100%. I feel like, surely something is gonna happen with the Dragon Balls again, right? Like the dragon cannot be dead. The dragon cannot be dead because that means the master, oh my God, uh, Chozu, Kuririn will, will still be dead, he'll stay dead. A lot of other people who are in the tournament, including Namu, I like Namu. Surely something has to happen so that the Dragon Balls come back and the, the dragon can come back. They're not staying dead, right? That's not on. Like, I kind of predicted that, yeah, they would just get the Dragon Balls again, resurrect everyone who's been killed by Piccolo, and the Dragon Balls will reappear a year later. And I just was not expecting so much of what happened in this. Like there were so many losses before we finally got the wins. And up until this point, I mean, Goku did struggle a little bit up to this point. In the previous arcs, we definitely saw some struggle there, but victory would pretty much always come unless it was part of a tournament. But in terms of like the bad guys, in terms of actual fights with bad guys, Goku wins and we saw him lose pretty spectacularly in this arc and what I loved is that he did have to keep trying and trying and he went back to that Karen Tower to get stronger. It wasn't just that easy for him and now that we have, I, I, well maybe there's another way that we can get them back, like maybe there's another way we can resurrect them, but I have no hope. Like at the start of this arc I had hope. I had hopes and dreams that we would restore everyone, bring them back to life, but no. That kind of got dashed and I just kept feeling my heart drop with each chapter and how strong and formidable King Piccolo is. Even though that's like a little bit of a silly name. He was not a silly character really. Like wow, the fact that he could make the monsters out of his body or he could like spit out the monsters and they would like hatch and just be fully formed and ready to kill people. Like that was so awesome. And yeah, now we have his son who's gonna avenge him now. Like that'll be so exciting. So I know that the final arc is called Piccolo Jr. arc. So I kind of had a feeling that there would be some kind of continuation with that storyline. But yeah, I was just, uh, it, this arc started so dark anyway because the previous arc ended in such a dark place. And King Piccolo getting the roster of all the tournament people and killing them one by one while getting the Dragon Balls. Honestly, I, my heart broke for Namu because I'm like, well, I really want Namu to be restored now. Like I, I feel really bad for these characters. I really do feel for these characters, even the ones who we only see very briefly. I really care for them. I want them to be restored. And like, I don't fully love the turtle guy because of all the pervy stuff. But like on the other side of that, he really gave his life to try and stop King Piccolo. And it was such a, a heart-wrenching scene anyway. And the fact that Goku could feel it, like I care about the turtle guy because Goku cares about him and he is, a strong character in his own right and him standing up to King Piccolo was absolutely awesome and yeah I was a little bit sad when he passed but I'm more sad for Goku than anything else you know he's lost his best friend he's lost his master it just feels like well what next how can we possibly restore them now the moment when King Piccolo asks to be young again when he was at his fullest power and then he gets his wish but then he kills the dragon ah I was not expecting that, like that was insane to me. Maybe a little bit too easy how all the Dragon Balls were like collected pretty quickly. And I feel like because it's like the third time now in like, what was it like 13, 14 volumes that the dragon's been summoned. I'm like, okay, it's easier to get the Dragon Balls than it is to find the One Piece for instance. And I know like the trackers and stuff definitely helps. Like that really does narrow it down. But yeah, it did start to feel like the Dragon Balls were being a little bit overused. A part of me is kind of glad that there is no way of using it again unless something gets reversed or there's something else, maybe a loophole or something that I might find out in the next arc. Like, unless something like that happens, I just don't know, like, what's gonna happen with the, the Dragon Balls now? And, like, <laughs> will we be able to restore our friends? I don't know. It's so exciting, though. Tenshinhan was an absolute MVP of this arc, too. The way that he was trying to 
train himself to use like what the the dragon seal power or something to get Piccolo into the rice cooker because the master missed. So Tension Han was trying to train himself to to get him in it, and that was just so great. Considering he was like against us in the previous arc, and he's done this like full one eighty in this arc. Although you did say the natural progression into that, like it wasn't out of nowhere. But I just love how different he was in this arc compared to the previous one. And I just love how much he is on the side of good. He is just an excellent character. He's fast becoming one of my favorites again. I really liked Yaji Robe. Is that how you say it? I You guys are probably laughing at me. But the guy that Goku meets, I really liked him as well. I liked the fact that he was just like wanting to eat things and uh, Goku ate his fish and he was really pissed about that. So he ended up eating one of those, well, the dragon thing, that, uh, what was it called again? Symbol? The symbol in Tambourine. Tambourine is the one who killed Kyurin, who Goku ends up taking down, thank God. But yeah, I do really like Yaji Robe. I like how he, when he sees Goku was not actually dead, and he picks him up, and Goku's like, water, and Yaji Robe just runs to the water and helps him, like, no questions asked. It's like he realized just, like, how immense and powerful Goku is, and just how terrifying a situation it was to be up against Piccolo because Yaji Robe does run away and I don't blame him for that at all but I do love the fact that he took Goku straight to the water helped him get to that Karen tower the Karen pole thing and got him all the way up to the top so Goku getting back to the tower I really did like that we got back there and then he drank this water like super water of the gods or something and nobody has survived it except Goku like Goku was like the first person to survive it and you do really need to have someone who is superhuman or beyond superhuman in order to take down King Piccolo because Piccolo, High Low Piccolo, he was just so... I just realised, yeah, High Low Piccolo, is that... is he named after that? Yeah, Piccolo was too strong. He was out of this world strong. So Goku did need something to help. So I like that he managed to survive that almost poison he went through hours of torture. And again, like, I get flashbacks to Luffy and Impel Down in One Piece. But with Goku being able to stop Piccolo, and yeah, Piccolo was gonna destroy a, a different province, a different city every single year on May 9th, which is the day that King Piccolo managed to become king. And Goku manages to stop him by fisting him, essentially, by putting his fist right through him and killing him. I was so shocked by that. I thought he would have to get trapped by the demon seal. So I was a little bit surprised at how that fight ended, but damn, putting that fist right through him and killing him and, oh God, that was uh, really gross. Like this arc is probably the most violent and the goriest arc yet. And just to see people get like bisected and, you know, holes blasted through them and people getting killed left, right and center. What a change from the early arcs of Dragon Ball. Just, it's it just feels so different. Still really great. In fact, I much prefer it this way than I did in the early days. Yeah, the first fight actually between Goku and Piccolo, when he first comes up against him, and you see how bloody and beaten Goku is on the face. Like, his face is so badly damaged. He's got, like, blood everywhere. His eyes are darker. Like, I've never seen him look that beat up before, at least I don't think so. He just looked close to death, like the closest to death he's ever come. So it did really add so much stakes and yeah, it just wasn't an easy fix to take down Piccolo. It took a lot more than usual and it really paid off, I think. It really paid off in the end. This arc, I'm gonna give a nine out of 10, but definitely my favorite arc so far. It just changed what I expected from the series. It just totally, made me think so differently on how we approach the story and the fights. And it was like some of the best fights I've seen so far and the most exciting of the story so far. Now I have no idea what's gonna happen next. I really do not. This arc just grabbed me by the Dragon Balls. I finished and I really loved it by the end of it. I was so unsure on this whole Dragon Ball thing at the very start, but this is a series that I personally believe just went from strength to strength and really found its footing by the midpoint in my opinion. And it just became 
so good. Like, I really enjoyed this arc again. Probably my second favourite arc at the minute with an 8.5 out of 10. I love the fact that we got another tournament and we got to finally see Goku win. I've been waiting for that moment. I mean, the whole tournament thing did get a little bit repetitive by this point, which is why it isn't my favourite arc so far. Because I know in Japan, Dragon Ball Z is like still Dragon Ball and it's not really a separate series or anything. And I really do want to read Dragon Ball Z as soon as I possibly can get my hands on the complete box set of Dragon Ball Z. I'm going to save up for it. I promise I will get it. I will read it all and do another video like this because I'm a Dragon Ball fan now. I'm so sad that I didn't get to be a Dragon Ball fan when Akira Toriyama was alive, but I'm here now and better late than never. I love how at the very start of this arc we have bloody Goku getting trained by like God, my Kamisama, and I'm just like how how can Goku get more powerful? How can he get stronger than what he already is now? And this story just keeps surprising me like how much more stronger can you get? God, obviously. Like God is the the ceiling, I guess. And it was a little bit weird as well how this god, this Kamisama, was like Piccolo, or at least, like, I'm trying to wrap my head around it, but I think it was like this evil worm kind of thing that um, had to be expelled out of Kamisama, and that was the only way that he could become god, and that like worm, that evil part of him, was like the Demon King Piccolo, and that's kind of how that whole thing happened. I would like to watch the anime. I think that will help maybe fill in some blanks that I might have missed while reading and just to understand some of the things a little bit better too. And I think seeing the fights actually happen too will be epic. But yeah, it was a bit of a surprise to see a sort of image of Piccolo being God or like Kamisama. And Mr. Popo as well, uh, that whole exchange was pretty good. And I'm still always so surprised that Goku always has more to learn. And we got to see the culmination of that in the tournament that happened. And yeah, like I, again, I really do love tournaments. I love that tournament aspect of it. I love all of the battles and the fights that happen with it. But yeah, this is like the third time in 16 volumes that we've kind of had a tournament. The same tournament, the Strongest Under the Heavens tournament. And yeah, I, I do think at times I was like, okay, this isn't as exciting as like the previous arc. I thought the previous arc had a lot of stakes, which, you know, like we had everyone get pretty much resurrected in this arc. So really like what stakes are there really when everyone just like is saved by the end. But I don't think that detracts at all from like how much I love the previous arc for instance and how much I really do enjoy the story. I do think like the Dragon Balls are maybe like a little bit overpowered now and it kind of does eliminate any kind of true stakes if all they have to do is like collect the Dragon Balls, make a wish and everything's okay again kind of thing. So I don't know how that's going to work moving forward. Just when I think that, oh, it's never going to work again, we have the dragon get resurrected. And I'm so glad everyone did get resurrected though because I was so sad. I'm so glad that Kyura Rin, for instance, is resurrected. Oh God, I missed him so much. He did not deserve to die. But nonetheless, I will be keeping my eyes out for whatever happens in Dragon Ball Z. If we do even have the Dragon Ball element anymore or if it's just like name alone. So Goku was trained for three years. Three years later, he's tall. He is tall. I was so shocked. I mean, I shouldn't be shocked because he's obviously going to grow. But like seeing Goku like, full on adult now, pretty much, like being tall, I was just flabbergasted at seeing how different he is. Not different in terms of like personality and stuff. He still has a lot of his old traits, but he is just like, oh, he's fantastic. His fighting ability is so great. It gets better and better. And again, I think, where is the ceiling for Goku? Because he just keeps surpassing it. Oh, another kind of resurrection thing where I was a little bit like, oh, okay, was the assassin who Goku took down, but now he's like a cyborg and they do defeat him, but I think he's still gonna come back later potentially because the uh, the crane master took him away, his brother. So like, I feel like that is probably gonna come back to bite us in the ass too. But I was kind of surprised to see him come back. Actually, I have another reunion as well with Chi Chi. I had no idea who she was either. I was trying to rack my brain being like, who is she? Because she obviously knows Goku and Goku's like, who are you? And I'm like, who is she? Who is she? So when that fight with Goku and Chi Chi happens and we finally find out, I was like, oh, of course, of course. And the fact that he is betrothed to her as well is so funny to me. The fact that he's like, oh wait, yeah, hang on. I did say that. I did say that I would take whatever your dad would give me, which was her hand, her hand in marriage. So that was like really comedic. I'm kind of interested to see where that's going to go now. Like, are they gonna be a thing? Is that just like a, a comedic thing? I don't know, but that was really funny. Oh, I was really proud of Kuririn as well during his fight to know when to give up 
and I think it takes a lot of strength to know your limits. So even though I kind of knew like the last battle would be between Goku and Piccolo Jr, that Kuririn wouldn't make it too much further. So like him actually being like, yeah, I, I can't go any further, I'm out kind of thing. That was like really good. I really liked that and it just showed so much more progression with his character too. Like the character arcs of all the characters from the first volume to now, or whenever we first met them, is amazing. And Kuririn is definitely someone who I think has come such a long way, despite being dead for an entire arc. He still just continues to surprise me as well. I'm not surprised that Yamcha still has a lot to learn too. Like he always seems to underestimate people and every single time he's in a tournament, he, gets to like the last like eight and doesn't really seem to be able to progress after that. So it'll be interesting to say if maybe in Dragon Ball Z he becomes a lot more stronger. I was shocked during the whole like Shen and the uh, Piccolo Jr. fight and finding out that Shen was God aka Kamisama. So it does make sense that Yamcha wouldn't get further than him. But at the same time the fact that God was trying to get Piccolo Jr. into the the jaw, the demon seal thing, and he ends up getting taken into it himself. And then Piccolo Jr. swallowing it. And then later on, when Goku fights him and, you know, he goes giant, and Goku goes inside his mouth and gets the, uh, the jar out. Oh my god, that was amazing. But the whole fight between Goku and Piccolo slash Piccolo Jr. was fantastic. I loved it so much. One of my favorite fights of the series. When Piccolo regenerates his arm as well, oh, that was disgusting. And when he blasts Goku through like the shoulder chest area bit there, and it looked like Goku was dying. I mean, I knew he wouldn't die, but still, that was intense. It was still like so much fun. And I think that's one of the things that I really do like about the Dragon Ball fights is that even though they do come across as quite intense, they are just so much fun too, and so fun to follow along with. One minute, I love the sleight of hand sometimes when Goku manages to, like say actually when Goku is fighting with Ten and he takes Ten's belt, like that whole exchange was kind of funny, but it kind of does again show you just how much Goku has progressed this entire time and how much faster he's gotten. That was so funny, but so good. But yeah, the battles can go like really dark one minute to like really light the next. And I love the the dichotomy between them. <laughs> one of my favorite moments that's like so underrated is when lunch like kicks God down the hole. <laughs> you know, when she's like, I don't care if you're God going down there kind of thing. Like she just kicks him down there. That was so funny. I kind of love the fact that Goku helped restore Piccolo. So he does win. Finally, yes, he finally wins. And I love that. I've been waiting years for that to happen, <laughs> but I'm so glad Goku did win. And he ends up allowing Piccolo to get healed, to have that thingamabobby, the, the, the bean thing that helps him get healed. And Piccolo has gone off and he's gonna get stronger and he's gonna come across Goku again. So I love the fact that Goku didn't take him down just now because he appreciates the fact that he has an arch enemy. Oh, but like the moment where I actually started to get a little bit emotional was during this whole moment here about like the importance of the Dragon Balls. And the master says about the Dragon Balls who created Goku would never have become what he is. None of these heroes would have. From just one Dragon Ball, this saga began and so the world was saved. And it's all of these like really cute, nice moments of all of them together. And it's just like a family, you know, it's like a, a family that I ended up really growing to care for by the end of this 16th volume. And I just got like a little bit emotional, I'm not gonna lie. I was like, oh my God, like this is so sweet and I'm gonna miss these characters until I pick up Dragon Ball Z, of course. But then of course it made me also feel sad for Akira Toriyama who created this incredible world. And I've just loved his illustrations. I have loved his story so far. I didn't think I would enjoy it as much as I did, which is a huge testament to his writing style, especially at the start of the series when I thought, oh, I don't think this is really gonna be for me after all. Like it isn't really what I was expecting too much, but then it surprised me and it really hooked me in and I'm so glad that I did end up loving it. Ash has come in again to interrupt filming. It's just like you wanna hear me talk about Dragon Ball. I might call you Piccolo because you're so annoying. Mm. Sorry, my notes are a jumble. But when Goku and Kuririn and Yamcha had the turtle school uniforms, even though they didn't have to, and they each got their uniforms just because they wanted to without telling each other either. It was like a nice little surprise. And that was just so sweet. <sighs> Riven in the moments every single time. Oh, and then how can I move on from this? But Goku passing down, being a god, Kamasama says, you know, you're good enough to surpass me. Like you can be a god and Chi Chi can be a goddess, you can live up in the heavens and all of that. And then Goku's like, 
It was boring enough when I was there for that little period. I ain't gonna be no god. That was so funny. Only Goku would turn down that kind of opportunity. That isn't Goku's life. He is gonna continue getting stronger and he's gonna continue fighting. One day he's gonna defeat Piccolo Jr. and it's gonna be incredible. It's gonna be so good. I imagine that will be what Dragon Ball Z might lead up to potentially. I'm not sure. But I'm so super happy that I did it. I finished it. I finished the original Dragon Ball series. Eee. So take a look at my final arc rankings and arc ratings as well. I do feel like these are my final ratings. I know I changed them a few times during this video, I apologize. But I do think the King Piccolo arc is my favorite, followed by Piccolo Jr., then the Ten Shinhan arc, the Commander Red arc, the Fortune Teller Baba arc, the Tournament arc, the Red Ribbon Army arc, the General Blue arc, and then finally is the Emperor PLF arc. But we did have to start somewhere. We might as well start from the bottom and just grow from there, and that's what we did. And that is all of Dragon Ball Red. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please do give it a like if you enjoyed, subscribe if you haven't already. Leave all your comments down below to let me know what you thought of the vlog. Let me know what you think of Dragon Ball. Tell me absolutely everything down below. And hopefully I will see you in the next video. Bye.